Welcome everyone. The webinar is about to begin. Please note today's call is being recorded. The Consumer Bankers Association is pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Escape Velocity, Four Stages Toward High Performing Card Programs, presented by Zeta. My name is Isabella and it is my pleasure to facilitate today's event. Thank you for joining. Please note we are recording recording and all participant lines are muted. If you have any trouble, please email conferences at consumerbankers.com or send a message in the Q&A box. This presentation will last up to 60 minutes and will include question and answer opportunities at the end. You may submit a question at any time by entering the questions into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. As a reminder, the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not represent the views of CBA or its members. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, David Shipper, a strategic advisor at Datos Insights focused on retail banking and payments. He is the author of the report we will be discussing today titled Escaping the Legacy Card Tech Hamster Wheel, which is based on his interviews of payment executives at banks, as well as Datos Insight research and expertise in payments. Alan Ng is Managing Director of Payments Technology Consulting for Accenture. He brings over 20 years of consulting experience in payments, technology, and cash management modernization for global banks. Alex Johnson has 20 years of experience in financial services and is the founder of the popular newsletter and podcast, Fintech Takes, which is focused on the intersection of financial services, technology, and public policy. And finally, we have Gary Singh, who is the president of North America for Zeta, a global next-gen card processor. He brings over 20 years of experience as an executive in technology and finance. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and I'll hand it off to Gary. Thank you, Isabella, and good morning, good afternoon uh, to the audience for joining us today. Delighted to be on this conversation, and thanks to CBA for uh, hosting us to, to have this very uh, exciting conversation today. Uh, as most of you know, um, you know that banking has had many challenges to overcome over the last you know couple of uh, decades as the as the industry moved into the dig digital world right everybody struggled through the whole process of what to do what do we do with our branches uh, but today for example everybody has digital banking uh, to basically put on a layer to provide digital services to your consumers and it's become you know pretty much a commodity and a table stake solution in the marketplace but the actual digitization of products and services has still not happened in banking. This is when you're natively building products and services to provide those next generation capabilities that most consumers are demanding when you move into the digital space, right? Whether you're watching Netflix or how you shop these days, you know, banking is still by and large has a layer of digital access, but they're not digital products per se, even though at the core, they're supposed to be digital products because it's basically moving money and uh, digits and, 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 and things like that. So today we're faced with this dilemma of saying that we understand that legacy systems are constraining us to basically deliver true digital products and services that consumers are demanding. And it cannot be just done by saying, hey, I have a digital team and that does a wrapper of mobile banking around legacy systems. So that sort of concept is under threat as the next phase of banking evolution into the digital space is taking place. In our conversations with you know banks of uh, or, or the folks like yourself on this audience, everybody acknowledges this fact, right? There's no debate that this is a challenge that they're stuck with the legacy. They don't know how to move forward. So either they don't have the risk appetite for change, uh, which is true. Uh, you know, as we all know, we're we're in the risk business, and sometimes change is hard. Um, or they just don't know how to start this process. So they they have the acknowledgement that they have to do this but they sometimes are either stuck on whether they have the fear of change or whether they have the beginnings of how to start the change uh, within their organizations. We believe some of this change should start with the payment side of the business because that is the tipping, you know, the, the, the tip of the spear where consumers have the most engagement with banks. Um, it's the beachhead that you wanna establish on a day-to-day -day basis and really starting to engage um, in a deeper, more meaningful way with your customer base. So um, today we're going to talk about the latter piece, which is that, you know, how do you start make, taking these steps to um, uh, modernize your systems? What are the different approaches, the pros and cons? Um, you know, should you move fast? Should you move slow, et cetera? Uh, delighted to have David uh, from Datos, uh, who's done a very, very uh, compelling and detailed research on this. Uh, so without further ado, let me just uh, turn it over to David to talk about his research and uh, and the outcome and 
and whatever you can garner out of that research. So over to you, David. Thanks, and I will try to share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so I, I'll spend just a few minutes on key points from the research report. Um, as we talk about in the paper, and Gary talked about, card issuers, banks, credit unions are all at some level of maturity towards modernization. So we developed this maturity model as a guide and, and discuss how a bank or credit union can progress their card program. So to start a legacy dependent card program is very common and means that the card issuer is completely reliant on a legacy platform. These platforms are workhorses. They get the job done at a basic level, but they're old and it, they can't keep up with the rate of change and the type of change that we're seeing from more innovative competitors. If you're on these platforms, um, then you're probably the last to implement new innovations or respond to market changes or consumer demands for card functionality. If Apple Pay were announced today, you'd watch everyone around you launch it while you waited on the sidelines for your processor to prioritize and to build that for you. And you may not get it at all. I know of banks and credit unions that still don't support mobile wallets or contactless cards, and it's influenced a lot by their legacy card platform. Developing is kind of the next stage of modernization, and you can get there by a couple of in a couple of ways, um, either by remaining on a legacy platform that's going through updates, making APIs available, maybe moving to a cloud-enabled environment, uh, or issuers move into this phase by working with a modern card processing platform as a sidecar where maybe one card product or some of the card products are converted or new card products are launched from basically developing by testing and learning and taking steps towards modernizing the card products. Um, and then third is modernized. This is a full conversion of the card program to a modern platform, preferably cloud native, taking advantage of no code, low code environment, full API access, um, the ability to design, build and launch new card products with little or no card processor involvement. Um, this is a modern card program. And the previous step, the developing stage is just a stepping stone to becoming fully modernized. And then lastly is transformative. So you have a modern card program, but what we kind of, as we were performing this research and, and we looked at things, we, we see that there's limitations to that because the card program doesn't operate in a silo. Um, the card platform interacts with other platforms. So in the report, we talk about having a transformative card program is a really high bar that begins with the card platform, but ends with everything else. Like having a modern core or modern underwriting or any platform that influences the card program is modernized. Um, and now I'll go through a few more details in the next slide. Um, I won't read all of this. And there's a lot more detail in the report, but we looked at this problem of banks and credit unions struggling, thinking about being stuck in that hamster wheel, working really hard to remain in the same place and the attributes or benefits of moving up that maturity model. Legacy dependent, very limited. You rely on the vendor even for minor changes like adjusting a fee or performing research because you might not have access to all the data that you want. Last month's data is available at the end of this month, and you're probably not getting all of the fields that are available in the transaction or any other field um, or any other data set that you would like. Uh, you're among the last to get new features, mobile wallets, push provisioning, virtual cards, and, and that's assuming that your card platform provider ever makes those available to you at all because some platforms are just too old to be easily built on top of. A developing card program is better. It's the beginning. It's definitely not the end. But here, um, you might have a different customer experience between card products depending on which platform they're issued on. If you have a sidecar where you're testing things, it, it can be a little bit more complicated to manage operationally, but this is a step in the right di direction. And moving into the developing phase provides a lot of benefits for you and the card holder um, as you move towards modernized, where things get very nice for the card program. Uh, it's easier to manage, easier to update. Adding new features is more simple and can be done in-house or with the help of the platform provider. But even if you're using the provider, it's going to be most likely faster and less costly than it would be trying to open a ticket with a legacy platform and go through the project approval process and everything that comes along with that. 
card data is more real time. A lot of benefits are unlocked. There are limitations as I talked about. If the platform's not connected to other modern platforms, for example, you can create a card record in real time, but maybe it's added in batch to the core, or maybe it doesn't show up on online banking until the next day. Um, but you know, those are small things, but the goal in time is to move beyond the card processing platform. So here in Modernize, you have a very nice card program. But then next step, obviously, is transformative. It's the ideal state, requires investment across the organization. You have a modern card program, modern core, modern application or underwriting platform. Basically, anything that influences or interacts with that card platform is modern. It's the best customer experience across all products and touch points. Um, you can choose the best of breed vendors. You're not as limited. So you don't have as much concern about integration. Data is available quickly. More data is available. Helps to maybe maximize and test AI use cases. It's a really high bar, but it's kind of that last moment that brings you closer to future proof where you can respond to market changes very quickly. Um, and then finally... I pulled this chart from the report. We spoke to bank, uh, 12 bank and credit unions, qualitative interviews to understand what they're looking for and their thoughts around modernization. Looking at some of the top benefits for card programs, what they are most interested in, building a, a having a better digital experience is at the top, um, followed by reducing card processing costs, driving more top of wallet behavior. So better CX, lower cost, higher income, um, and what I think is key to point out here is that having a transformative card program is a great goal, but these benefits the, on the screen really start to unlock as you move up that ladder to developing where you're making small improvements and testing and learning or to modernized. Uh, these benefits, these reasons to move to a more modern card program start to show up during that journey to your ultimate goal of being transformative. So you can unlock these benefits as you go. And with that, I will turn it back to the group and we can continue the conversation. Thank you, David. Um, wonderful research, uh, very timely as well. And uh, just to, you know, we're going to take a quick poll uh, at this point to uh, uh, from the audience to understand and get a feel of uh, what they think about uh, key capabilities um, and why modernize to the next stage. So we'll take a quick pause here. The folks on the call can take uh, a moment to uh, uh, participate in this poll. We would appreciate it. All right, so uh, are we gonna get to see the results? There we go. Great, so I see uh, two things are standing up to the top. Oh, can you guys put that back on or? Are we are we going to lose it? Okay. There we go. Uh, fast for innovation, real time data, AI, um, all very very appropriate sort of benefits of uh, modernizing your architecture and going forward. Build differentiated experiences. That was on the top of your poll. Uh, you know when you did it, David, and, you, and the data you provided. So, so yeah, good interesting insights from uh, what folks are thinking about. And with that, I think we'll uh, move into a discussion. So I guess, you know, one of the first things to ask, I guess I'll turn it over to you, Alan. Um, David talked about the four, four options, you know, and, and uh, but from your perspective, right, why do this? What's the risk of staying with the status quo and staying in the first phase? And there's two parts to this question. One is, what do you see in the near term, right, in the next few years? And then what do you see in longer term over the next decade, if you pretty much stay in the first phase of your uh, modernization journey? Yeah, thanks, Gary, for for the questions. And and by the way, the 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 paper is very insightful. If uh, if you haven't seen it, definitely download it and take a look. Um. So when I when I read through the papers, I mean all the all the um the trends and also the four phases that you know David you described it it resonate really well. You know to 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 me, I I think the you know, the, the key challenges, right, you know, we see as an industry right now is, right, I mean, there's a lot of anxiety, or uh, I should say, discussions about modernization, but nobody are trying to take the action. So I think you, you have to kind of going back and take a look of, um, which is kind of interesting, because our chief researcher, David Healin, before he retired, he actually did an analysis for us and look at the 50 years of the history. 
of the um the the U.S. credit card industry, and and he come up with five cycles. And right now, as an industry, we are at the the fifth cycle, which is the po pandemic stage. I think as an industry, we, what we notice is, I mean, we came out from the pandemics largely, I would say, doing pretty well, right? There were some initial pressures, um, you know, causing interest income to decrease, but the industry as a whole rebounded pretty well. I mean, we are seeing year to year six percent increase in account openings, so it's not it's not a you know in a in a really bad stage. But I think that the risk to your point, Gary, is if you don't take action. As an industry, we are now at the verge of entering the sixth cycle. And this number six cycle is going to be dominated by or supercharged by technology innovations, right? So a lot of the questions that you see previously, right, in the survey are pointing to innovations, are pointing to digital omnichannel, right? We also see AI, Gen AI popping up on the screen. But I would say that probably the most important um, you know, kind of, you can say risk or opportunity and a horizon is the diversification of payment methods. Because that to me is kind of the quote unquote, the killer, right? You know, for these legacy card processors that they couldn't handle anything other than card, <laughs> right? And, and we are starting to see, right? You know, the emergence of the, the, the trend now in the industry, like, you know, buy now, pay later is just the starting point, right? We are already seeing, a lot of uh, you know new payment types are, are are popping up right you know in other geography and sooner rather than later it will arrive in in US. So I think you know in in the short term right a, a lot of the um you know the you you know the you know going after digital and innovations uh you know from the you know from the short term perspective I think it makes perfect sense to us. But what we need to really keep keep in mind is, right, the industry that we are dealing with when we entering this sixth cycle is going to be very different than what we have seen previously. Now, the question is why, right? Why, why we are not quite there yet as an industry, right? And, and it is largely driven by two factors. One, it's just the heavy relying, reliance on the legacy processing, right? You, you can see the numbers and, and the, the research from, you know, David's paper, right? I mean, we are, uh, you know, the current industry is, is one of the bigger lagger, right? When it comes to, you know, payment modernization comparing to other part of the payment ecosystems. Um, there's still a lot of legacy processing. The second factor I would call it is the card executives fear of modernization, <laughs> right? There is a general fear of getting into, you know, into modernization and giving up my legacies and changing the way how we operate, right? So we will talk a little bit more in, you know, in 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 some of the subsequent, um, you know, discussion, but that's kind of, you know, my take on, you know, the kind of the near term as well as the, you know, the longer term impact. No, well put, uh, well put, Alan. Uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, uh, those insights, and couldn't agree with you more on the on the last statement. Uh, you know, there there are a lot of bank executives who are stuck on that sort of you know decision uh, in terms of, hey, I have legacy tech, I know I need to modernize, but how do I get to that next? Uh, what is my first step in in sort of taking that forward? Because the industry has seen the struggles in terms of you know migration and conversion risk and the cost of risk. Is high, which is why the legacy systems haven't even, you know, um, uh, modernized themselves because you have a captive market that is stuck with a uh, with a moat around it. So why why take that uh, initiative? So with that in mind, I think maybe Alex just continuing on that thread. You know, um, Alan talked about the risks of not doing this, uh, but what do you you know since you you know follow the latest trends in banking and fintechs? That's the keyword and fintechs. What do you see are the biggest competitive threats that banks should be thinking about, you know, from the outside world, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. The The thing I've been thinking a lot about is at the top of that uh, survey that um, was shared uh, based on the report that, that David did, you know, one of the number one motivating factors for modernizing this stuff is to create better digital experiences for cardholders, right? And to me... That is kind of a placeholder statement for we want to make sure that the products and experiences that we're enabling for our customers are 
sort of up to par with what's happening in fintech and making sure that we're not sort of falling behind and that at, at minimum we have table stakes capabilities. So when you think about sort of how modern card issuing fits into what fintech is building, the way I kind of split it out is there's sort of three different ways to think about it. One is uh, the card is a product itself, right? And so obviously there've been lots of fintech companies that have launched card products. Um, I think for the most part, they started in debit. They're now starting to migrate over to charge cards and to credit. But when you think about you know the product itself and the card as a product construct, the innovation is all around different ways that that construct can be expressed to the end user. So it's not just a plastic or metal card. It is a set of virtual cards that you can issue for all different types of capabilities, including getting free trials or you know signing up for subscriptions that you can manage. So enabling more sort of flexible uses of the credential. Um, it's also making the credential itself more flexible. So we see this at a network level with what Visa is doing around flex credential and the ability for a card number to point to multiple different funding sources. Uh, I think a firm, um, you know, Alan mentioned buy now, pay later, they're going to be one of the first companies that's going to build on that flex credential to tie debit and buy now, pay later together within the same card construct controlled by the end customer, which is pretty cool. And then of course, you know, David mentioned digital wallets and Apple Pay, and none of that is going away. In fact, banks are really aggressively trying to catch up on digital wallets through pays and a number of other initiatives. And so I think at a card product level, you see lots of innovation around the construct and sort of how it's expressed to the end customer. The second <clears throat> manifestation of the card in a fintech context is the card is a business model. And um, again, this is where I go back to sort of the shift we're seeing in fintech. Everyone started in debit. This is why smaller community banks are oftentimes the partners for fintech companies is that they have Durban exempt interchange rates that they can offer. We're starting to see that migrate away. And you know these Durban exempt business models where it's just built around debit interchange, those are kind of no longer acceptable in fintech and fintech companies are trying to expand beyond that. So you see a lot more competition around charge cards. You see a lot more competition around credit cards. And a lot of the barriers that used to exist for fintech companies getting into credit are going away because a lot of modern card issuing platforms can support debit and credit. There's a much more robust uh, private credit industry that can sort of provide the balance sheet behind the credit card. And so you see a lot more innovation moving into charge cards and credit and not just being stuck in debit. And then the final thing I just wanted to mention really quickly is uh, the card as data. And this is, I think, the one that gets a little bit lost, but when you think about, you know, building digital products, which, um, you know, Gary, I think that was something you mentioned at the very beginning, like, how do you build digitally native products to be competitive in this new environment? I think one thing we need to sort of wrap our heads around is that a lot of the products that consumers want don't look at all like card products, right? And so I'll use like Ramp as an example here, but I think this this construct applies pretty broadly. Ramp isn't a card. That's not the core product. The core product is a set of software workflows that are designed to help companies save money. And you can understand how that same approach of building software that's designed to provide automation, intelligence, that's designed to save money, save time, that type of construct can work extraordinarily well in B2C, in B2B. It works in all kinds of different use cases. And the key is, it's built around software. Software is the product, that's what you're buying. And the card is just an enabler for all of the software to work. And so the card is what's transmitting the real-time data. The card has APIs built into it. And so you're able to connect all of the different software workflows that you're building. When a transaction happens, it can trigger a set of actions to be taken. And so all of the data and intelligence built into Ramp or similar products is enabled by the card sort of facilitating the data transfer across that software product, but the card itself is not really the point. And I think directionally, that's where FinTech is headed. And when I think about where banks need to go to sort of keep pace, it's thinking beyond the card as a product construct and thinking more of, is it an enabler for the types of software-driven experiences that consumers and businesses want? Very well said, uh, Alex, and I couldn't resonate with this with you on this more uh, in our sort of conversations, uh, just to give an anecdote on this, was talking to a few banks, and uh, they wanted to launch uh, the small business card. 
And one of the things that they basically talked about um, is, look, I got to integrate this with my mobile banking application. And I'm like, why? Why do you want to bury this inside a mobile banking application? You should really think about what is the purpose of this card and how does this help the small business or the businesses you know, optimize their payments and their fund flows, et cetera. So think about this as a tool that you're giving to the to the business, not that I need to embed this into my mobile banking application. Uh, that's, and that's a huge example, right? Yeah, 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 no, yeah. it's that's that's exactly the right like mind shift you have to go through, right? Because we're so we're so built to sort of compete in this environment of I have a set of distribution channels. I have a set of products that sit essentially on the shelf in those different distribution channels. And I'm launching a new product. I have to find a way to plug that into my mobile banking. And maybe you do, yes. but to your point, the question you need to start with is what experience or outcome am I trying to create for my customer? Exactly. And what's the best way to do that? And the thing that's cool about modern card issuing is we've completely abstracted away all the details. And so like, maybe they don't even need to get a physical card. Maybe it's all powered by one-time virtual cards that are issued by the software when you need it. Or maybe you have to be able to issue multiple cards to different members of a family and the cards have different capabilities that are tuned to the individual members of the family. And there's an app that controls it at a household level. Like there's a million different ways to think about product development when you divorce yourself away from that physical card, mobile banking mindset that we've sort of been stuck in over the last 10 years. Absolutely right. And as Alex Hughes had pointed out earlier, right, you're going through the sixth cycle. And, um, you know, um, so, so I'm sorry, Alan, you had mentioned the sixth cycle. And Alex, you talked about thinking about it from a really from a digital native perspective, how to build the right product for the audience that you're building. That sort of comes from a from from where we are sitting as a as a modern platform provider is micro segmentation and hyper personalization. And if you look at the fintechs, I think they all are segmenting in a very narrow way. They're, they're by design building a product that is highly segmented and differentiated because they serve the market that needs their product in a unique way, right? And we think that banks can basically provide that with a modern architecture by understanding their various audiences and start to go down that path of, as you talked about it, think about this from a virtual card perspective, as that next you know, wave is coming, as Alan, you pointed out, be ready for both of those so that you can basically tap into the growth. And with that, you know, I would say maybe, David, since you had, did a lot of these interviews, you know, you know, where do you think most of the issuers are sitting in the spectrum today as you were doing these interviews? Uh, and what are some of the things you heard from them as you were doing the interviews about why are they stuck in the particular phase? Yeah. I I mean, it, it probably doesn't surprise anybody that um, most most I, I, are in a legacy platform. They're in that legacy dependent. Um, they understand a lot of the issues that come along with that. Um, and they just, you know, the savvy bankers, I think, know that they need to modernize. They need to move up. Uh, but, you know, they're not sure how to take that step. You know, they're, they're kind of that. And, and I think, Gary, you mentioned the fear of that full conversion, right? But... I think what they realize is that even if they're not trying to be first to market on everything, you know, that used to be that, well, we don't, we're going to be fast followers, but now it's in a legacy environment, it's difficult to even be a fast follower. Um, you know, you're really getting the, the longer that I, at, at, over the years, I've noticed that that fast follower gets slower and slower because those legacy platforms, they're just, you know, it's, it's just not a, an ideal situation. They can't, they just can't keep up. And, and it's going to, I think that gap's going to be the big, you know, get bigger and bigger on the um, amount of time that it takes for you to react to some market change. But the biggest challenge is that, that fear of a full conversion, which is why in the report, and, and even when we talk to clients, we talk about a sidecar implementation. You can go, you can launch something that's modern. You can test one product on it, or you can ver convert a product or launch a new product, you know, there's ways to test that environment. And maybe that takes, you know, an extended period of time as you learn and you understand and, and you start to integrate that platform with, with um, your other, you know, systems that you have. Um, I think that that is probably one of, one of the strongest ways to overcome that fear of a full conversion. Cause I, I think that's holding a lot of people back is, you know, yeah, we know we need to update, but I feel like if I do a full conversion, then, 
my head of operations is going to quit. And so, you know, like they, there are people that, you know, this is uh, not a small, you know, ask. Um, I also think that what I noticed, you know, I've worked in banking before starting here, but a lot of the legacy platforms or some, um, they placate the the bank and credit union. Everything's around the corner. Uh, we're, you know, we have that slated. We're going to work on that, you know, and it's it's always something better is coming. Um, and I heard that complaint actually in the conversations. Um, waiting for push provisioning is, as an example, push provisioning from the mobile banking app to um, a virtual wall or, you know, a mobile wallet it's been promised by by one of the interviewees. It's been promised for two years. That it was just around the corner, just coming. And I think there's a lot of that happening. It's always coming soon. Um, but again, that's also the reason why I think, and you know, as I as I talk to a lot of bankers, I see it's waiting for the and de depending on the legacy platform provider to to upgrade you and and to take care of you. I think it really bankers almost need to take this into their own hands um, and, you know, look at how they can innovate and, and go to something a lot more modern and work up that maturity model that, that I shared earlier that's in the paper. Yeah, David, I think uh, completely resonate with your last statement as well, which is uh, 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 placating the, uh, the, 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 uh, the customer, right, from the legacy perspective. And this is the number one frustration I've heard at least when we're engaging with our prospects, you know that frustration comes to the first meeting. Uh, and the second point about you know speed, right? So as you go into digital, you know we call it the compounding uh, competitive uh, disadvantage if you don't start now, you know because digital things start to move very rapidly, right? You can start to iterate faster, you can launch new products faster, you have real time access to data, so that that gap starts to widen very very quickly, and you've seen that in other industries, right, where the digital leaders basically get so far ahead uh, that the rest of the pack never catches up. I think that is the, at least from our perspective, Alan, I would say that's the the sixth cycle that we're sort of entering into, which would really separate you know some of the leaders from from the followers uh, in a very very meaningful way. Even though regulatory landscape kind of keeps the 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 you know, it into an even playing field. But that disruption is is sort of uh, ready to happen, I think. So with that in mind, I think Alan, I think there's a there's a lot of conversations about okay, this makes sense. The survey said, you know, these are the advantages. Everybody is, you know, in in a very strong sort of uh, alignment that this needs to happen. Maybe give give an idea about you know what does it take to go from you know stage one to four or two to three or you know, how long does it take, you know, budget, people, dollars, you know, whatever guidance you can give from a, a effort and, and cost perspective, you know, to kind of give a high level view of what it would take. And of course, the benefits are there, right? They got to figure out the business model at the end of the day and the business case. But any comments on, okay, let's, you know, we know we want to do this. So how do we do this? And what is it going to cost? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the I think the, the the logical way to approach it is, I mean, you know, to David's point, right, is let's, you know, get 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 us out of that fear, right, and and start getting into you know into stage two, right, because I would make the argument that any one of us can start stage two right away, right, with, without a need to you know to to wait. Um, we we have experience working with you know close to you know thirty plus issuers uh, across the uh, you know North America and you know have been involved in some of them very sophisticated consumer and you know commercial portfolios and and no surprise right when we walk in you're going to see fifty percent of the landscape right uh, being dominated by the big three players right I mean that's the legacy you know we are dealing with. And and I think the the reality is right, and most of the you know the the card executives is being approached it right, you know, by the big three and say, hey, you know, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that, we're going to modernize. The 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 issue we 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 are dealing with right, it's not just a promise, it's the reality because they are also busy at modernizing their call, right? So it's a question of you know, it's not just a promise, but do you you know do do you want to wait, right? And can you afford to wait, right? For you know, for the legacy issuers to complete their modernization so that they can expose the new features to you. So on average, we we see modernization program um, take 
you know, no two program are exactly the same, but usually we take approximately between, you know, fastest will be roughly two years to, you know, to the range of three years. And it really depends on a number of factors, but the most dominant factors is the size of the portfolios, right? I mean, are we talking about a 5 million accounts or are we talking about a 30 million accounts, right? I mean, that, that could make a huge difference. And also the complexity of some of your portfolio, right? You know, credit, debit, right, prepaid, you name it, right? Fleet card. <laughs> so, you know, it depends on the complexity, what makeups of your, your portfolio, um, you know, how many co-brand that you have, right? You know, that you need to, you know, to support and communicate and unwind. Um, I would say the two areas that, you know, probably suck in the most effort in in terms of modernization is. Number one is the disconnect and reconnect, right? You know, your processor with the ecosystems. Um, on average, we are seeing between 30 to 40 interfaces, right? That you have to, you know, to switch over. And if you have to do it in one shot, right? It's, it's a, you know, that is sell, right? It's a, it's a pretty significant exercise. But I think even if we can take care, right? You know, the, the technicality of the connecting, reconnecting. The biggest fear, you know, very similar to what, you know, David, you observed when we're talking to card executives is the migration itself, right? That the fear of the migration and usually migration is taking up the, the longest, it's like the longest pole in a tent, right? I mean, the, you know, to, you know, to, to, you know, to bring in a new call, right? And starting to hook it up and starting to, you know, to, you know, to put some of the customers and new products on it. I mean, that's relatively easy comparing to you. We are talking about, you know, 30 millions of, you know, cuts we need to migrate, you know, to the, to the new platform. So that's the kind of the reality, um, you know, we are dealing with. But I think the, the one area that we notice is, is kind of a little bit counterintuitive is um, a lot of the card executive take more time to consider whether they should do modernization than actually doing the modernization themselves. We have noticed, and, and Gary and I have talked about this before, right? I mean, on average, we, we, we notice issues are taking at least two years, up to two years to talk about or thinking, contemplating to modernize, right? In some cases, even longer, but the actual modernization itself, right, is, you know, is two to three years, right? So it's that kind of the, uh, you know, I mean, that, that just kind of, I, I would say, artificially making the, the timeline longer, it actually, the actual effort itself is, is reasonable, but when you are adding in the two to three years of contemplating and waiting and analysis and pronalysis and not taking any action, that make it worse, right? That, that make it unbearable. And going back to your point earlier, Gary, right? The digital world moves much, much faster than what we have experienced in the last 50 years, those five cycles, right? So if, if you don't take an action right now, um, that to me is the biggest mistakes. Yeah, no, great point, Alan. And I think the analogy, since I worked in different industries, not in just in banking, right? So I had that experience of how things evolve, for example, in retail or supply chain management or even in networking space. You know, one of the things that comes to my mind is that, you know, sometimes some folks are just driving their car by looking in the rear view window versus looking front where they need to go. And the reason I state that is because a lot of the you know experiences in the past were going from a legacy to legacy, which fundamentally creates more chaos because there's two proprietary systems you know, that were built you know 40 years ago that you're not trying to do the conversion on. But I think it would be nice to look from a refreshed perspective when you go from legacy to modern, the risk is different. It's not the same that you were doing legacy to legacy because there's two dysfunctional systems talking to each other. Now, at least you have one dysfunctional system talking to uh, you know a much more optimized and modern system. So, with that in mind, maybe uh, turning over back to you, Alex. You know, uh, and you saw this in the survey as well that you know one of the advantages of modern platforms is speed, right? Speed to market. Uh, speed to accessing data, you know, there's a whole bunch of things. And we talked about the compounding sort of competitive advantage if you move faster. So, um, you know, what do you, what is changing in the market that you think is is driving this, you know, urgency around speed, uh, if, if those two words go together? <laughs> yeah, no, they absolutely do. I mean, I think the, not to continue to harp on ramp as an example, but they're just yep. sort of top of mind for me right now. I mean, 
they're a good example of, I think, what's generally true in the expanded field of competition that banks are facing. And this competition is fintech companies, but it's also uh, big tech companies. It's non-financial services brands that are adding or embedding financial services into their offerings. One of the things that's generally true across all of these new groups of competitors is they really prioritize speed and the speed at which they ship new products. And you know the way to think about that product set, and again, I think it's, it's a bit of a, a mindset shift for financial services companies is, you know, in financial services, we have a lot of ways of making money without the consumer actively choosing to pay us, right? So we get paid with interchange. We get, um, you know, paid via the float that we're able to get on deposits or payments that we're making. Uh, we make money on interest that gets paid, but it's kind of built into the payments and it happens behind the scenes. There's not a lot of like explicit choices that consumers make to pay like a subscription fee. And that I think has been enormously beneficial for financial services providers in a lot of ways. But one of the disservices that it provides to us is it creates less urgency to always be trying to iterate and continue to earn your customer's business. Whereas a lot of these new competitors that are taking advantage of modern card issuing and are building cards into their software products, a lot of them have an installment uh, or I should say a uh, subscription-based business model where every single month or every year, however the contract works, they're trying to earn the business of their customers. And so they have this mentality of our product can't be static. It can't be just one thing that we roll out and then maybe a couple of years from now, we'll revisit it and see if we want to make upgrades to it. It's a constantly evolving service that you are subscribing to where every day, every week, every month, you are delivering new features and new capabilities. So yeah, I mean, I think, uh, Gary, to your point, the the benefit of speed is that it allows you to keep pace with the innovations that you see in those other competitive fields. And, you know, I, I, I really did resonate with uh, the report. I, I would echo what Alan said. It's a really great report and everyone should download it and, and read it. But one of the things that came through very clearly in it to me was, uh, as you're saying, that compounding benefit of being able to move fast and to iterate and to have every single piece of your technology stack, including hard issuing, which sits at the middle of a lot of these other uh, capabilities, all of those need to be able to be dynamic and to be able to interact with each other quickly because, you know, in these organizations that move quickly and ship code quickly, ideas kind of burble up from everywhere, right? And you sort of want to be able to take advantage of a more decentralized and organic approach to innovation where someone says, hey, I have an idea. And the first thing that someone says is not, oh, we'll add that to the list of things to ask our legacy card issuer to get to three years from now, right? Like that, that roadblock just kills that kind of organic decentralized innovation, which I think is where all banks and credit unions are trying to get to as a place where innovation just kind of burbles up and it's enabled by that technology. Yeah, no, well said, uh, uh, Alex. Uh, that's that's absolutely to the point. And maybe uh, taking a slightly different uh, turn on the panel for a moment, David, um, when you were doing this report, um, what were the things that surprised you? I mean, there's a lot of insights that we got, right, from your report, obviously, from Alan and Alex. Uh, but what were the things that surprised you uh, as you were doing this uh, doing this interviews? Well, it's funny um, because... Just pause it real, real quick, uh, David, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to jump in and say if people have questions, please put them in the Q&A now as after we finish with David's answer, we'll look through and we'll start to answer some questions from, from the audience. All right, thanks. Sounds good. Sure. So, um, well, one thing that you mentioned, Gary, was a, a surprise to me, which is the number... <sighs> moving from an old legacy platform, migrating from that to an old legacy platform. And it it seemed, you know, it, especially in today, and, and, and maybe it's just lack of knowledge of what's out there, not really looking around and just relying on the vendors to tell you what's best for you. But I, I heard that more than once <clears throat> of a migration and a conversion from an old platform to an old platform. And they had the same complaints. Uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't better. It was just a different platform that you needed to learn. Um, integration was brought up and I, it wasn't so much, I wasn't surprised by it, but I was kind of surprised by the sacrifices that um, 
at least a, one or two interviewees kind of talked about having to make. You have a rewards program provider that you want to work with. They have, a, you know, you've spoken to them and it turns out, well, they're not pre-integrated and it'll take this much effort to integrate them. You can use the APIs, but the APIs don't provide everything you're looking for. So we'll have to do a batch file or file transfer on top of that. And just having to kind of, instead of going with your your choice, um, just having to go with the what's already pre-integrated and maybe paying a little bit more, not getting everything you want. And so I think, you know, that conversion from legacy platform to legacy platform was a surprise. And then that having to make sacrifices on choosing a, you know, a, a best of breed or, or the vendor of your choice because the integration is just too complicated or too costly or too timely to make something work. Yeah. And I think to your point, you know, the integrations are also legacy, right? So, so it's a compounding sort of uh, baggage, so to speak, in that context. And I think it really does create an opportunity for regionals and super regionals and uh, smaller banks to go after the big four or the big five banks, right, at, from some extent, because their strength is the weakness. They have more complex proprietary integrations, which will slow them down, and you're more nimble and fast. So basically, you know, you go in and deploy, you know, new solutions quickly, even in, as phase two you talked about, or the second option is a sidecar approach. And I don't think, you know, banks should be uh, afraid that they have a superior product um, in market alongside an inferior product. Let the customer have the choice. That shouldn't be, I, I heard that as a reason sometimes to say, hey, you know, this will make my old product look bad. Well, that's not a, you should cannibalize your old, right? You should rather than, having somebody else, uh, you know, steal market share away from you guys. So I think that creates an opportunity for those that don't have those complex integrations to move a little faster in the market and perhaps take share. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you for the panel. And I'm going to turn it back to Chris to go into some Q&A and, uh, and take it from there. Yeah, so everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll be happy to have people answer them. Um, got one to get things started here. Um, and I'll just toss this out to, to everybody. Uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see banks make when taking on this type of effort? I'll start. Uh, I'll say the biggest mistake they make is uh, not taking on the effort. Uh, I've been in, we've been in a lot of RFPs where they start the process and bring in uh, modern players and legacy players, and then they do nothing. Uh, and that basically goes back to the status quo. Um, I think that's pretty much what I would say is perhaps the intent wasn't there to begin with uh, because there were the fear of change was there, Chris. Um, but in terms of folks that have taken the step forward, uh, you know, they've reaped the rewards. So there's no question about it. And Alex uh, gave some good examples there um, in terms of what's happening in the market. So I think this is this is one of those situations where there has to be enough buy-in, um, you know, across the executive line all the way to the CEO down, to say change is good, change needs to be embraced, time has come, uh, versus uh, sitting in a risk-averse uh, manner. So I'll I'll turn it back to the panel to see if there's anybody else. Yeah, want I, to. I I I'll jump in with a comment here. So I. I think going back to the fears, right? And you can't blame, you know, card executive having that fear. But I, I think, you know, part of the way or how we're dealing with the fear is making sure that, right, you have a partner, right, you know, that you can work with. Because for most of the card executives to replace their card core processing system is a once in a lifetime or once in a career opportunity, right? No one have done it like, you know, 50 times, right? But you know, working with the partners, I mean, you can leverage all the experience, right? You know, that the industry itself, many, many players have gone through that journey, have gone through the transition, right? Very few people are at stage four, right? But there are plenty of examples of stage two and stage three. So I think as an industry, we can absolutely harvest from that experience, right? And and leverage other people's learnings to, you know, to to reduce the, the the amount of mishaps and mistakes, right? You know, that you would, you know, make along the way, right? When you when you modernize your systems. So uh, another question I can answer directly, uh, where can we access the research that's been referenced here? So if you're a subscriber to Data Insights, you can access it on their website, but uh, through our partnership on this, um, we are gonna provide a free copy to everybody who's attended the webinar here. 
So we'll be emailing that out within the next 24 hours. Um, and let's see if we have another question here. Um, <clears throat> Alex, you talked a lot about the fintechs. Um, what about some of the innovative things that banks are doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm actually seeing banks do a lot uh, to sort of catch up on the fintech side. I mean, one one example that I'll I'll share is um, I've started to notice uh, a lot of banks that have been um, competitive in the corporate card or B two B space really embrace more modern technology um, in order to wrap APIs around their cards, in order to create more of a developer-centric platform around their cards. And the idea there is we don't necessarily want to build those end experiences for businesses ourselves because we don't think that's in our wheelhouse. That's not um, something that we want to be able to try to compete on directly. But we would prefer that the next ramp or the next Brex not build their software around their own card that they issue, but rather enable any cards, including ours, to be integrated into the software that they build. And so they're essentially embracing sort of more modern card issuing capabilities in order to make their cards more accessible within the software platforms that their clients want to use them in. And so I think that's a really good and pretty tactically smart way of taking a step in the right direction. And that doesn't mean that they can't build their own uh, B2B or corporate expense management software products themselves in the future. But in the short term, they're just trying to get to the point where at least their cards can be used in that software rather than their clients having to make a choice between keeping their card or getting the more modern software that they're looking for. So there's a lot of gets to the point of the paper, intermediate steps that you can take without having to jump all the way to the end of building those software products on day one. Um, well, I think we have time for one last one here. Uh, David, uh, I'll direct this to you, but you know, I think everybody has talked a lot about how you know bankers know they need to do this. They understand the risks and benefits. Is there anything that surprised you in your interviews or anything that you felt like maybe bankers had a blind spot for? Um, again, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about this. I, I do think that there, you know, there, there seems to be this um, acceptance of, of where you're at. And um, the, this, this idea that, that, you know, the, the current provider is going to take care of something they've been promising for a very long time. Um, and I think that, you know, what we've talked about in this conversation with with looking for ways to take even small steps um you know a, a large conversion is definitely possible those those do happen and and they can have you know they they can be completed um internally or with help but the baby steps i think is something that a lot of bankers really hadn't thought of before right having that sidecar having you know this ability to test and learn as you work through the contract that may have years left on it um, but you know, that gives you time to test a new product, integrate it into your processes, get operations up to speed, you know, get bankers trained on this new platform that you're converting to. And I think just that that's a mind shift, right. In, in how that we normally think about something. It's usually you just, you stop doing the, you stop using this platform and you go to this platform and it doesn't have to be like that. I think bankers are starting to realize now that not only do they need to modernize, but modernizing today is probably a lot easier than it would have been five or 10 years ago.